Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. Today, we will begin our second video on thalassemia. In today's video, we're delving into the world of alpha thalassemias, where complex genetic mutations are at play, causing anemia and posing intriguing challenges for diagnosis. So, buckle up, as we embark on a journey through the wonders of genetics. In our last episode, we explored beta thalassemias, where the beta globin gene cluster is often affected by point mutations. But, in alpha thalassemias, it's a different story. They're mainly associated with large deletions involving the alpha 1 and or alpha 2 globin genes. But wait, that's not all. In alpha thalassemias, we also encounter non deletional mutations, mostly point mutations, but they are less common. The extent of reduced production of the alpha chain depends on the specific mutation, the number of affected alpha globin genes, and whether the affected gene is alpha 2 or alpha 1. Here's a cool fact, the alpha 2 globin gene accounts for approximately 75% of the alpha chains in normal red blood cells. So, mutations in the alpha 2 globin gene can be more severe in causing anemia compared to those affecting the alpha 1 globin gene. You see, it's all about the gene's power. Now, let's talk about the normal alpha globin gene complex, which we denote as alpha alpha. This fancy term indicates the presence of two normal genes, alpha 2 and alpha 1, on one chromosome 16. So, a normal genotype is alpha alpha slash alpha alpha. Time to explore the types of alpha thalassemias. First up, alpha zero thalassemia, where both alpha globin genes on chromosome 16 are deleted. That means there's no production of alpha chains from that chromosome, and we denote it as dot. Interesting fact, right? Alpha zero thalassemia is found in about 4% of the population in Southeast Asia, less frequently in the Mediterranean region, and infrequently in other parts of the world. Next, let's explore alpha plus thalassemia. Here, a mutation in one alpha globin gene results in decreased alpha chain production from that chromosome. So, we have alpha for deletional mutations and alpha T alpha for non deletional mutations. Alpha plus thalassemia is widely distributed in the thalassemia belt in Central Africa, with high carrier frequencies in regions like Saudi Arabia, India, Southeast Asia, and Africa, reaching 50% to 80%. It's also found in about 30% of African Americans. Now, let's meet one of the common non-deletional mutations, the intriguing constant spring, or alpha-CS haplotype. In this mutation, a point change at position 142 in the alpha-2 globin gene leads to a unique journey. During transcription, extra bases are added to the mRNA until the next stop codon is encountered. This elongated mRNA is quite unstable and results in the production of only a small amount of the alpha-CS chain. The alpha CS chains, now with an additional 31 amino acids, join with beta chains to form hemoglobin constant spring. But, the incorporation of a longer alpha chain makes the tetramer unstable, creating a real challenge in detecting hemoglobin constant spring through alkaline hemoglobin electrophoresis. Now we're diving into the fascinating world of clinical syndromes of alpha thalassemia. These four syndromes bring unique challenges to our precious red blood cells. Let's explore them together. The four syndromes are Silent carrier state Alpha thalassemia minor Hemoglobin H disease Hemoglobin Bart hydrops fetally syndrome Our adventure begins with the first syndrome, the silent carrier state. In this condition, one of the alpha globin genes is deleted, leaving three functional alpha globin genes, alpha slash alpha alpha. The alpha to beta chain ratio is almost normal, and there are no noticeable hematologic abnormalities. Sounds silent, right? But wait, there's more. At birth, there's a minor excess of gamma chains, which combine to form tetramers of hemoglobin BART, gamma 4, in the range of 1% to 2%. Detecting the silent carrier state reliably requires genetic analysis. Another way this state can occur is through a non-deletional alpha plus mutation in one alpha globin gene, alpha T alpha slash alpha alpha. In the case of the heterozygous mutation alpha CS alpha slash alpha alpha, hemoglobin constant spring makes up less than 1% of the total hemoglobin. Next up, we have alpha thalassemia minor. This condition is primarily caused by the deletion of two alpha globin genes and exists in two forms, homozygous alpha plus, alpha slash alpha, or heterozygous alpha zero, slash alpha alpha. Don't worry, it's generally asymptomatic. 
Individuals with alpha thalassemia minor may experience mild anemia with typical hemoglobin levels ranging from 12 to 13 grams per deciliter. Their red blood cells are microcytic and hypochromic, a true journey into the world of blood cells. At birth, the proportion of hemoglobin BART, gamma 4, in their blood is usually around 5% to 15%. Quite fascinating, right? In adults with alpha thalassemia minor, the production of both alpha and beta chains is balanced, so hemoglobin H, beta 4, is typically not present. But, beware of homozygosity for non-deletional mutations in both alpha-2 globin genes, alpha-T-alpha slash alpha-T-alpha. This can lead to mild to moderate hemolytic anemia, often accompanied by jaundice and an enlargement of the liver and spleen, hepatosplenomegaly. Quite an adventure, huh? In individuals with the homozygous mutation alpha-CS-alpha slash alpha-CS-alpha, hemoglobin constant spring makes up around 5% to 6% of the total hemoglobin, and their hemoglobin concentration is usually between 9 to 11 grams per deciliter. Then we have hemoglobin H disease, a unique and intriguing condition that affects our precious red blood cells. Hemoglobin H disease is caused by the deletion of three alpha globin genes, leaving only one functional alpha globin gene, slash alpha. This genetic condition is more common in Asians, mainly due to the prevalence of the alpha-0 gene haplotype. But what happens inside the body with this fascinating condition? In hemoglobin H disease, excess unpaired beta chains accumulate, forming tetramers of hemoglobin H in adults. At birth, hemoglobin BART makes up around 10% to 40% of the hemoglobin, with the rest being hemoglobin F and hemoglobin A. As we grow, hemoglobin H largely replaces hemoglobin BART, leading to hemoglobin H levels ranging from 1% to 40%, along with reduced hemoglobin A2, traces of hemoglobin BART, and the remaining hemoglobin A. The combination of the non-deletional alpha plus haplotype with the alpha-0 haplotype, slash alpha-T alpha, usually leads to a more severe form of hemoglobin H disease with higher levels of hemoglobin H compared to the interaction of alpha-0 haplotype with the deletional alpha plus haplotype, slash alpha. Wow, it's like a puzzle of genes. Patients with hemoglobin H disease experience mild to moderate, chronic hemolytic anemia, with hemoglobin concentrations averaging between 7 to 10 grams per deciliter and reticulocytes count of 5% to 10%. But wait, there's more. Factors like infections, pregnancy, or exposure to oxidative drugs may trigger a hemolytic crisis, requiring temporary transfusions. In hemoglobin H disease, the red blood cells appear smaller and paler than usual, microcytic and hypochromic, and display various abnormal shapes, including target cells and other peculiar forms. Oh, the mysteries hidden in our blood cells. Hemoglobin H is sensitive to oxidation, leading to the gradual formation of inclusion bodies of denatured hemoglobin within the circulating RBCs. These inclusions affect the RBCs' shape and elasticity, contributing to their reduced lifespan. But there's more to this puzzle. Hemoglobin H disease is also linked to two distinct conditions, alpha thalassemia retardation 16, ATR 16, syndrome and alpha thalassemia X-linked intellectual disability, ATRX, syndrome. In ATR 16 syndrome, patients inherit or acquire a large deletion in the short arm of chromosome 16, leading to physical deformities, intellectual disabilities, and hemoglobin H disease. A true blend of genetics and physical traits. ATRX syndrome, on the other hand, is caused by mutations in the ATRX gene located on the X chromosome. Males affected by ATRX syndrome exhibit significant intellectual disability, physical deformities, developmental delay, and hemoglobin H disease. A remarkable example of how genes influence our entire being. Lastly hemoglobin BART hydrops fetally syndrome. A severe condition that affects precious little lives before they even have a chance to enter the world. Hemoglobin BART hydrops fetally syndrome is caused by homozygous alpha-0 thalassemia, slash, resulting in the complete absence of alpha chain production. Unfortunately, this condition leads to fetal death either in the womb or shortly after birth. The fetus with this syndrome suffers from severe anemia, causing cardiac failure and leading to the accumulation of fluid in the fetal subcutaneous tissues, a condition known as hydrops fetalis. It's a heart-wrenching struggle for the little one. The predominant hemoglobin in the affected fetus is hemoglobin BART, gamma 4, along with a small amount of hemoglobin Portland, zeta 2 gamma 2, and traces of hemoglobin H. However, hemoglobin BART has a very high affinity for oxygen and fails to deliver oxygen to the body's tissues. Oh, the challenges these tiny bodies face. 
Although the fetus can survive until the third trimester due to hemoglobin portland, this hemoglobin cannot sustain the later stages of fetal development, resulting in severe oxygen deprivation. It's an uphill battle from the start. Most often, the fetus is delivered prematurely and is either stillborn or dies shortly after birth. Apart from severe anemia, edema, and ascites, the fetus experiences significant enlargement of the liver and spleen and an enlarged heart. The blood of the affected fetus shows severe microcytic, hypochromic anemia, hemoglobin concentration of 3 to 8 grams per deciliter, with many nucleated red blood cells in the peripheral blood. A heart-wrenching sight indeed. Hydropic pregnancies are dangerous for the mother too, leading to toxemia and severe postpartum hemorrhage. A challenging time for the mother, both emotionally and physically. Ultrasound testing during mid-gestation can detect hydropic changes, helping identify and understand the condition. If both parents carry one alpha-0 thalassemia haplotype, slash alpha-alpha, prenatal diagnosis of homozygosity can be achieved through molecular genetic testing of fetal cells obtained from chorionic villus sampling or amniotic fluid. This enables early detection and informed decisions. In some cases, early termination of the pregnancy may be necessary to prevent serious maternal complications. A heartbreaking but crucial decision. Thalassemia associated with structural hemoglobin variants. Hemoglobin S thalassemia. Hemoglobin S thalassemia, alpha genetic wonder that goes by many names, including sickle cell anemia, hemoglobin SS, alpha, thalassemia. Picture this, the perfect genetic duo. Hemoglobin S and alpha, thalassemia haplotype team up to create the incredible combination known as hemoglobin SS, alpha, plus, thalassemia. Wow! This fascinating partnership is relatively common in populations with African ancestry, where these amazing genes hold a special place. Hold on to your seats, because here's where it gets really interesting. Individuals with hemoglobin SS, alpha, plus, thalassemia the study, are lower. It's like a genetic superpower, keeping them stronger and healthier. Let's take a peek at a fascinating genetic study. In this groundbreaking research, individuals with different genotypes were observed. Those with alpha-alpha-slash-alpha-alpha, alpha-slash-alpha-alpha, and alpha-slash-alpha genotypes had average hemoglobin concentrations of 8.4, 9.0, and 9.5 grams per deciliter, respectively. Meanwhile, reticulocytes count were 10.8%, 8.8%, and 6.9%, respectively. Incredible results. But wait, there's more. Let's explore the fascinating world of hemoglobin S beta thalassemia, a compound heterozygous condition. This captivating syndrome results from inheriting one beta thalassemia gene from one parent and a hemoglobin S gene from the other. How extraordinary! This genetic wonder knows no bounds. Hemoglobin S beta thalassemia has been reported in various populations worldwide, including Africa, the Mediterranean area, the Middle East, and India. It's a global connection of genetic brilliance. Brace yourselves for a thrilling twist. The severity of hemoglobin S beta thalassemia depends on the specific type of beta thalassemia mutation inherited. Each one writes a unique genetic story, making every individual's journey extraordinary. Individuals with hemoglobin S beta plus thalassemia produce varying amounts of normal beta chains, resulting in a unique hemoglobin composition. It's like a genetic orchestra of hemoglobin S, hemoglobin A2, hemoglobin F, and hemoglobin A with each gene contributing its melody to the symphony. But wait, there's more. This fascinating condition allows us to distinguish it from sickle cell anemia through some exciting clues. We look for signs of microcytosis, where red blood cells are smaller than usual, and splenomegaly, where the spleen is enlarged. These signs point us in the right direction. Hold on to your lab coats, because here comes the twist. When individuals have both beta-silent thalassemia and hemoglobin S, it creates a condition that may be slightly more severe than the sickle cell trait. It's like two genetic superheroes joining forces. How do we confirm this incredible condition, you ask? Well, we rely on the power of cutting-edge tests like hemoglobin electrophoresis and HPLC. These advanced techniques reveal the quantity of hemoglobin S and hemoglobin A in the blood, guiding us on our genetic journey. Brace yourselves for an unforgettable encounter. When beta-0 thalassemia combines with hemoglobin S, the resulting phenotype is similar to sickle cell anemia. It's like witnessing a fascinating fusion of genetic elements. Both hemoglobin S beta-0 thalassemia and sickle cell anemia present severe painful crises as the predominant symptom. 
Yet, microcytosis and an elevated hemoglobin A2 level in hemoglobin S beta 0 thalassemia offer us valuable clues to differentiate it from typical sickle cell anemia. Nature's Symphony of Symptoms guides us. Hemoglobin C thalassemia, a condition where hemoglobin C and beta thalassemia come together in a mesmerizing dance. The result? Moderately severe hemolysis, an enlarged spleen, and captivating characteristics like hypochromia and microcytosis. And no, oh, keep an eye out for those enchanting target cells in the blood. What secrets does hemoglobin C thalassemia hold in its genetic code? As we peer into the mesmerizing hemoglobin electrophoresis patterns, we witness a kaleidoscope of possibilities. The unique beta thalassemia gene defect can lead to varying concentrations of hemoglobin C, it's a genetic puzzle waiting to be solved. Now, let's venture into the captivating world of hemoglobin E thalassemia, a significant health concern in Southeast Asia and Eastern India. Here, hemoglobin E and beta thalassemia intertwine in a delicate dance. The hemoglobin E mutation is caused by a point mutation in the beta globin gene, leading to decreased hemoglobin E production. In the homozygous state, hemoglobin EE, mild beta thalassemia like symptoms emerge, like whispers of a genetic tale. But wait, the plot thickens. In the compound heterozygous state, where hemoglobin E and beta thalassemia mutations combine, the beta chain production takes a dramatic dip. The clinical symptoms range from the graceful movements of beta thalassemia intermedia to the powerful strides of beta thalassemia major. It all depends on the specific beta globin gene mutation in this fascinating genetic symphony. Clinical examinations and fascinating laboratory methods. Our journey begins with the historical quest. Personal and family histories hold vital clues to thalassemia. And don't forget their ethnic background, as certain gene mutations love to make their presence known in specific populations. During the clinical examination, keep an eye out for captivating signs like pallor, jaundice, splenomegaly, and even skeletal deformities. They may lead us to the intriguing cases of untreated or partially treated beta thalassemia major. Now, let's delve into the enchanting realm of laboratory methods. Behold the complete blood count and peripheral blood film review, our trusty companions in this diagnostic adventure. In the thalassemia world, the CBC reveals captivating secrets. Witness the microcytic and hypochromic anemia with decreased hemoglobin levels. But here's the twist, the red blood cell count might appear higher than expected, leading to a very low MCV and MCH. And oh, the MCHC takes a delightful dip. In untreated beta thalassemia major, the RDW dances with anisocytosis, while in beta thalassemia minor, it prefers to keep things calm and normal. Enter the right stained peripheral blood film, a canvas of captivating shapes and features. In silent carrier phenotypes, RBCs appear normal, but in beta thalassemia minor, alpha thalassemia minor, and hemoglobin H disease, the microcytic cells flaunt target cells and poikilocytosis. And in the grand spectacle of homozygous and compound heterozygous beta thalassemia, extreme poikilocytosis takes center stage. Witness the beautiful array of polychromagy, basophilic stippling, Hull Jolly bodies, Pepenheimer bodies, and even nucleated RBCs. But wait, there's more. The reticulocytes count joins the symphony, a sign of the bone marrow's valiant efforts to compensate for the hemolytic process. Hemoglobin H disease reveals a reticulocytes count dancing between 5% to 10%, while homozygous beta thalassemia prefers a more subtle 2% to 8%, which might surprise you. And now, brace yourselves for the mysterious supervital staining technique. A secret weapon to detect certain thalassemias like alpha thalassemia minor, hemoglobin H disease, and silent carrier alpha thalassemia. Using brilliant cresol blue or new methylene blue, we uncover the elusive hemoglobin H inclusions. Their appearance, like greenish-blue gems, scattered throughout RBCs, creates a distinctive pitted pattern akin to golf balls or raspberries. It's important to note that these hemoglobin H inclusions are different from Heinz bodies, which are larger, fewer in number, and usually appear eccentrically along the inner membrane of the RBC. Assessment of normal and variant hemoglobins. Now we'll uncover the cutting-edge methods used to unravel the mysteries of hemoglobin variants. So, grab your lab coats and safety goggles, and let's dive right in. In the quest to identify and quantify hemoglobin variants, our trusty tools include hemoglobin electrophoresis, cation exchange high-performance liquid chromatography, HPLC, and capillary zone electrophoresis, CZE. Each method has its strengths and limitations, so it's like combining the powers of superheroes to confirm the presence of these fascinating hemoglobin variants. 
but to truly unlock the secrets hidden in globin genes and diagnose thalassemia or hemoglobinopathy, we must turn to the incredible world of molecular genetic testing. Behold, the traditional approach of hemoglobin electrophoresis at alkaline pH, a classic method for diagnosing thalassemia and hemoglobinopathy. We place a patient's red blood cell sample on a solid support and subject it to an electrical current in an alkaline buffer. As if performing an elegant dance, normal and variant hemoglobins separate and migrate based on their charge, forming distinct bands on the support. These bands are then stained and quantified using scanning densitometry, providing us with a percentage of each hemoglobin type present. But beware, for electrophoresis has its limitations. It may not accurately measure hemoglobin A2 and hemoglobin F levels, so to confirm the presence of hemoglobin variants like hemoglobin S and hemoglobin C, we need to call upon other techniques like HPLC or CZE. You see, hemoglobin D and hemoglobin G may slyly migrate alongside hemoglobin S, while hemoglobin E and hemoglobin O Arab may cunningly accompany hemoglobin C. Fear not, these confirmation methods ensure precise and accurate results. We often employ a solubility test for hemoglobin S detection. And remember, when it comes to prenatal diagnosis, carrier detection in couples, or unraveling rare and complex mutations, molecular genetic testing is the key to unraveling these enigmatic mysteries. Now, brace yourselves for the wonders of high-performance liquid chromatography, where a sample of the patient's red blood cells meets a special column in a buffer-filled world. Both normal and variant hemoglobins get a chance to bind, and then, the magic begins. An elution buffer with varying ionic strength joins the party, creating a mesmerizing gradient. As the different hemoglobin types gracefully move through the column, they elute at different times, known as retention times. A detector measures the absorbance of each fraction at 415 nanometers, painting a beautiful chromatogram with peaks that reveal the percentage of each hemoglobin fraction present. Now it's time to meet the star of the show, the Automated High Performance Liquid Chromatography, or HPLC. This modern marvel has taken center stage, replacing traditional hemoglobin electrophoresis in labs worldwide. HPLC is the go-to method for routine hemoglobin analysis, and here's why, it can precisely and rapidly measure hemoglobin A, hemoglobin A2, and hemoglobin F with remarkable sensitivity and specificity, but only when no hemoglobin variants are present. It's perfect for detecting beta thalassemia minor, trait, by quantifying hemoglobin A2 with precision. Plus, it can detect and measure hemoglobin variants even in minuscule concentrations. A true superstar, right? But every hero has its limitations. HPLC demands specialized equipment and skilled interpretation of complex chromatograms. Some cunning hemoglobin variants, like hemoglobin E and hemoglobin A2, can play hide and seek due to overlapping peaks. Oh, and here's the kicker, HPLC struggles to accurately quantify hemoglobin A2 in the presence of hemoglobin S or hemoglobin D Punjab, and it might miss out on identifying certain hemoglobin variants altogether. No worries, though, we have more heroes on the way. And now, make way for the remarkable capillary zone electrophoresis, or CZE. In this thrilling method, a patient's red blood cell lysate takes a journey through a thin silica glass capillary tube with an alkaline buffer. When an electric current is applied, the different hemoglobin fractions speed towards the cathode, guided by the electroendoosmotic flow. As each hemoglobin fraction approaches the capillary's end, a detector measures its absorbance at 415 nanometers, creating mesmerizing peaks on an electrophoretogram. The instrument then works its magic, calculating the percentage of each hemoglobin fraction by integrating the peak area and migration time. CZE has some fantastic advantages over HPLC. It's rapid, accurate, and can accurately quantify hemoglobin A2 even in the presence of hemoglobin E, bravo, CZE. But alas, it too has a nemesis, it struggles to precisely quantify hemoglobin A2 in the presence of hemoglobin C, as there's a slight overlap in the peaks for these two hemoglobin types. Fear not, though, for the combination of HPLC and CZE results can unlock the full potential of these mighty heroes. By harnessing the powers of electrophoresis, HPLC, and CZE, laboratories can minimize the limitations of each method and obtain a comprehensive analysis of different hemoglobin fractions. And for newborn screening programs, additional technologies like isoelectric focusing and mass spectrometry join the league, ensuring no hemoglobin variant escapes their sight. Molecular Genetic Testing Meet the HBB gene, a crucial player in the thalassemia puzzle. To start our journey, Targeted mutation analysis using PCR-based methods is our first stop. 
If we know the individual's ethnic background, we can identify the four to six most common mutations, achieving a remarkable detection rate of 91% to 95% in populations like the Mediterranean, Middle Eastern, Thai, and Chinese, and 75% to 80% in African and African American populations. That's extraordinary. But what if the individual's ethnic background is diverse or unknown? Fear not, for a more comprehensive DNA sequencing of the HBB gene comes to the rescue, covering various gene regions. This sequencing approach can detect approximately 95% of known mutations, talk about thorough detective work. And there's more. If our molecular detectives encounter a tricky case, where sequencing fails to reveal the mutation, we deploy further testing, like deletions or duplications analysis using techniques such as multiplex ligation-dependent probe amplification or array-based comparative genomic hybridization. We're relentless in our pursuit of answers. Now, let's shift our focus to the HBA1 and HBA2 genes. Just like before, PCR-based targeted mutation analysis is our first step, aiming to identify the seven most common deletional mutations. This approach sniffs out about 90% of all alleles, not too shabby. But what if we need more clues? DNA sequencing of the HBA1 and HBA2 genes or deletion slash duplication analysis comes to the rescue, ensuring we leave no stone unturned in our quest for answers. And hold on, the plot thickens. When the specific mutation carried by the parents is known, we open new possibilities for analysis. We can examine fetal cells obtained through procedures like amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling, offering valuable insights during pregnancy. Alternatively, Pre-implantation genetic diagnosis lets us test a cell from a three-day-old embryo after in vitro fertilization, allowing us to assess the presence of the specific mutation in the embryo before implantation. Remarkable, isn't it? Other procedures used in the diagnosis and assessment of thalassemia. Get ready to explore the cutting-edge techniques that empower medical professionals worldwide. First up, we have the alkali denaturation test, a powerful tool for quantifying hemoglobin F, also known as fetal hemoglobin. Unlike most human hemoglobins, hemoglobin F remains unaffected when exposed to strong alkali. This unique property allows us to accurately measure hemoglobin F in the range of 0.2% to 50% by separating it from other hemoglobins. Consistent methodology is the key to ensure precise results. However, modern times have brought automated HPLC to the forefront for quantifying hemoglobin F with greater speed and efficiency. Moving on to the klyhauer betka acid elution slide test, a method that unlocks the secrets hidden within peripheral blood films. By treating these films with a citrate acid buffer, adult hemoglobins are eluded from the red blood cells, RBCs, leaving hemoglobin F intact and resisting acid elution. The stained cells reveal a fascinating pattern, RBCs containing hemoglobin F appear stained, while those with adult hemoglobin take the form of ghosts. This test helps us determine the distribution pattern of hemoglobin F in RBCs, whether it's found in all RBCs, pancellular, or only in some RBCs, heterocellular. Additionally, it comes to the rescue in estimating the volume of fetal maternal hemorrhage, guiding the right RH immune globulin dosage for an RH negative mother who delivers an RH positive baby. However, with the rise of flow cytometry, a quick and accurate method for measuring fetal maternal hemorrhage, this test is gradually stepping aside. Now, let's journey to resource-limited settings where the single-tube osmotic fragility test is a valuable screening tool for thalassemia carriers. Based on the fact that carriers have hypochromic RBCs, leading to decreased osmotic fragility, this test is simple yet effective. A blood sample is incubated in a hypotonic solution, and in normal individuals, RBCs will lyse, resulting in a clear solution. However, in patients with thalassemia or other conditions causing hypochromia, RBCs won't lyse, and the solution will remain turbid. While this test isn't specific to thalassemia and can be positive for other conditions with hypochromia, it serves as a valuable screening method in areas with limited resources, offering a glimmer of hope in the face of challenges. Differential Diagnosis Between Thalassemia Minor and Iron Deficiency Anemia It's crucial to distinguish between these conditions to ensure accurate treatment and avoid unnecessary tests. When it comes to diagnosis, the clinical history plays a pivotal role. A family history of thalassemia suggests thalassemia minor, while a history of previously normal hemoglobin levels, significant bleeding, or pica, craving for non-food items like ice, points towards iron deficiency anemia. Now, let's explore the laboratory tests that doctors use to differentiate between the two conditions. These include serum ferritin level, serum iron level, 
total iron binding capacity, transferrin saturation, and hemoglobin A2 level. Additionally, a complete blood count and examination of a peripheral blood film are performed. It's essential to rule out iron deficiency before evaluating hemoglobin A2 levels for thalassemia minor, as low iron levels can affect hemoglobin A2 levels. In thalassemia minor, mild erythrocytosis, elevated RBC count, and marked microcytosis, low mean corpuscular volume, MCV, are more common. On the other hand, in iron deficiency anemia, the RBC count and MCV may be normal or decreased, depending on the stage of the deficiency. The red cell distribution width, RDW, can be normal or increased in both conditions, making it unreliable in distinguishing them. There are various discrimination indices proposed to differentiate between thalassemia minor and iron deficiency anemia based on different blood parameters. However, their sensitivity in accurately distinguishing between the two conditions varies, leading to potential false negative results, making them unsuitable for screening purposes. The peripheral blood film can offer valuable clues. Thalassemia minor may show basophilic stippling, which can help in distinguishing it from iron deficiency anemia. However, it's important to note that both conditions can present with target cells, so this finding alone may not be sufficient for discrimination. Stay up to date with our latest videos by hitting that subscribe button and activating notifications. Be the first to know when we release new and exciting content. Don't keep all this valuable information to yourself, share this video with your friends who might find it interesting and beneficial. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them down below. Until next time, take care and goodbye.